invite you to take out your notes page there. As you see, you got your scripture, uh, as well as always, uh, just a few points. I gave you just a tiny bit of white space for your own notes this week. Use it wisely. Um, or uh, you can also use your bulletin. In this series, it's important for us to remember and to remind ourselves exactly what we're doing here. Jesus, as he is preaching this sermon, has a theme. He has an idea that he's trying to stick with. And uh, last week I commented to David that it's interesting when you read things like the Sermon on the Mount all the way through from beginning to end. Because it often seems a little disjointed. Like have you ever read Matthew 5 through 7 without stopping in these little stopping places that, that we've created for ourselves? You know, you read the Beatitudes and then Jesus goes from the Beatitudes to talking about the law to talking about anger to talking about divorce and you kind of think to yourself, well, Jesus, you seem to be all over the place. How many, come on, I know, I know we've done it. We've, no? Okay, all right. Just me. That's fine. But you see, there is a theme to the Sermon on the Mount. There is a theme that Jesus is seeking to address. A theme that kind of made itself uh, prevalent last week as we began our discussion. But a, uh, a theme that, that we have seen the past two weeks and that will continue on as we look in our next three weeks of this series. And that theme is righteousness. Righteousness, and as we look at it in this section and uh, think about it in the, in the past couple of weeks, is an understanding of that personal relationship that we have with God. And therefore, and thereby, how that relationship then impacts the way that we see others. You'll remember last week Jesus said that our righteousness should exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And that concerning the nature of communal relationship, we explored that last week. We sought to leave behind a sense of, of legalism connected to a judgmental nature of sin and humanity. And we sought to engage the law of Christ. And the nature in which Christ brings the kingdom and reorients our lives to the love and grace that God has given to each and every one of us. And in the first week of the series, we engaged righteousness by looking at the Beatitudes and the understanding of how our righteousness, that righteousness that we have in God, seeks to humble us. It reminds us of our place, it reminds us of our calling and purpose that we have through God. And it's in these understandings that Jesus continues to move forward in his sermon. Probably now having spoken for about an hour. No, I'm kidding. I have no idea. I promise I'll keep it short. But you see, Jesus then becomes to consider, okay, I have spoken about this sense of relationship with God, this sense of humility that we carry amongst ourselves. I have sought to talk about our relationship with others and the way that we treat not only our friends, but our enemies. And I have seen the way in which we love our neighbor. And now Jesus wants to address, okay, we, we've got this nature in which you have humbled yourself before God. We have this nature in which you are treating your neighbor with the same love and respect that you treat yourself, and now you know what? I want to address the way in which we express and live into our personal relationship with God. And so what does Jesus say? Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. I'm sure many of us, including myself, might be, get, might be guilty of trying to make ourselves a little too pious in the world. We may not even realize it sometimes. We pride ourselves on how well we pray. Or we lift up, look how much I give to the church or to this organization or that organization. Or even sometimes we try and make our suffering look as distorted as possible so that others will see pride within us. Or that we become so engulfed in personal achievements that we become less guided by God and who God calls us to be and we become guided by our own selfish and egotistical selves. We should be guided not by personal ambition, but by the love of God that exists within each and every one of us. And these are the warnings that Christ is offering in our scripture today. This is done in a nature of building up our faith that perfectly embodies who God is and the way God calls us to behave. And so Jesus starts there. 
Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Jesus is latching on to a very specific part of that. He talks about this understanding of piety. Sometimes, often, this word from the Greek is translated into righteousness. Sometimes it's translated into justice. But sometimes I even just like to rest in the translation we get from the Common English Bible. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people. Well, Jesus, that makes it awfully hard for me to do my job. Because my life exists with doing my religion in front of other people. But you see, I think there's something deeper than this wrestling between what we do in private and what we do in public. I don't think Jesus is necessarily saying that public prayer is a bad thing. I don't think Jesus is necessarily saying that having a public faith is a bad thing. But having a public faith for the sense of pride and self-ambition is what Jesus is trying to get after here. Professor Warren Carter says of this, he says, Car or Carter is calling out that we must do right deeds for right reasons. Jesus is calling out that we find favor in God rather than the court of public opinion. So we do not do things because we think it makes us look cool in front of our friends. We do not do things because even we think it makes us look more religious or pious in front of other people. We do things because we believe in a God who is so great and wonderful that we can't help but express love and gratitude and praise and worship. That we love God so much that the only way that we can express that love for God is through prayer. That we know that the only way we can be in conversation with God is through prayer. That we are so connected and loving of God that when we see hurt and pain and we see an opportunity to give, we don't need to tell people that we're giving. But we know that when we offer things to God, that God does amazing and wonderful things. And that when we seek to, to fast, when we seek to do things to increase and enhance our personal relationship with God, that we do not need to show other people that we are doing it, but that we are doing it because we want to have a great and a wonderful relationship with God. It is important to be led in this way. Jesus seeks to disassociate the nature of, of giving, of fasting, of praying, even the manner in which we may try and, as Jesus says, serve two masters. Jesus tries to take personal ambition out of our faith and say that the one whom we serve is God. He gives tangible examples, often seeming to exaggerate these things. Talking about the Pharisees praying, standing on their soapboxes and offering these great and wonderful prayers to God. And talks about shouting from a, uh, using a trumpet to say that you have given. Or just distorting your face in a way that it looks like you haven't eaten in a few days. Our piety, our righteousness, the manner in which we practice justice is not a manner of worthiness in the world but it is a manner of acceptance in the kingdom. And so we have to start acting like it and having it guide our lives. We should be centering ourselves on a life guided by the humility of Christ. It's not that praying in public is a bad thing. Otherwise, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Rather, Jesus is getting us to understand the reasons why we pray. And as we look and we see, and I know I left out a little section there, but Jesus teaches us how to pray. And Jesus offers us a prayer that can guide our time, that focuses our minds and hearts, that includes glory and honor to God. That includes confession. That includes seeking God to work through us. Even when we pray in public, whether we're doing it for ourselves, whether we're praying in a, in a, in a manner of, of self-revelation or whether we're praying in an intercessory manner, that is, we're praying for other people, we do it in a way that does not boast about us. So like when I was with the kids, I, I don't pray and tell God, God, I know I'm a great pastor. No, I pray to God, make me a great pastor. Just as each and every one of us pray, Lord, make me a great disciple. 
Create in me a clean and a pure heart. Lord, show me your will. In the same way Jesus talks about fasting. When we think about fasting, our minds probably automatically go to starving ourselves. That's one way we could do it. But fasting can also happen in other ways. We could fast from, from some action or some event that we may think harm our relationship with God. Our minds often go to Lent, in a season of Lent where we look at fasting and we invite ourselves to use that time to grow that relationship. And Jesus reminds us of this fact. And Jesus gives the purpose of fasting to recenter our lives on God, to seek to grow and to lift up that relationship. Not to make us more piety, more pious or mightier than others, but instead that we are humiliated in fasting. We are reminded that it is God whom we seek favor from. And lastly, even though Jesus starts with it, I've made it back to giving. When we give, we do not do it so in a manner to show off. We do not show how much we give, how often we give. But we do it in a way that is giving to the work of what God is calling us to do in the kingdom. Hopefully most all of us in this church give. Hopefully we see the, the, the joy and the purpose of offering what we have to God. And this is further encapsulated when Jesus approaches an understanding of money in the later verses. When he talks about storing treasures in earth versus storing treasures in heaven. And Jesus is very quick to say that money is not a bad thing, but money that rules your life can corrupt your faith. It is impossible to be without money in our contemporary society. <coughs> Even though my bank account likes to read zero a lot. But it is the way that we use money. It's the way that we use what we have here on earth to do the work that God calls us to do. John Wesley speaks of money saying, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Why? Because there's an inherency that once we allow money to begin to take control of our lives... And we no longer serve God. But to allow what we have on this earth to be used to building up the kingdom shows that God is still at the center of our lives. Unfortunately, we are often ego-driven people. We enjoy people looking upon us and seeing how biased we are. It's something that we get as church people. We lift up how often we go to church. Or we are often judged by how well we may pray in public. Or how much we give. They're done to lift up our own self-interest or to make us look better in the kingdom of God. Hello. Yet we forget the nature and way in which we serve within the kingdom. We forget that when we serve ourselves or we serve money or we serve any number of things before God, that we have lost sight on the purpose of our faith. I don't think we think enough about the amount of control we allow things like personal ambition, money, or any number of things to control our lives. In fact, we become numb to this idea because we've lived within it for so long that we have been able to lift up these things. We've tried to convince ourselves that they're not, but I think when we get down to it, they really have. When we look at Jesus' intentions in this passage, we can get so wrapped up in the logistics of thinking that we have a public faith versus a private faith. But really all Jesus is getting us to think about is who is at the center of our faith. What is guiding us? It is a deity whom is glorified through our practices. Whether we're in our prayer closet or whether we're standing in the middle of Main Street, that all that we do, everywhere we go, all of our interactions with people are guided by our faith in God. Am I driven, we ask ourselves, am I driven by a need to pray in public? Do I need people to hear me pray so that they know that I'm a good Christian? Do I need to shout from the mountaintops how great my faith is so that people know that I'm religious? Do we justify all this by taking the time to do the internal inventory? recognize the way in which we may have misinterpreted what is at the center of our faith. 
These are supposed to be tough lessons. They're supposed to take a lot of thought and inward reflection upon ourselves. And yes, even 2,000 years after Jesus speaks these words, we may still be wrestling with, and may even feel like we've missed the mark on how these practices should be reflected in our day-to-day -day life. But we are reminded each and every day that faith is not a moment of time. Mm -hmm. That while we are justified in Christ, we are still on that path to perfection. The practical implications here is a deep and inward glance. Do we treat the church as an extension of the kingdom that we so cherish being a part of, that we long to be together, that we long to use the resources that we've been blessed to help the community we are in, that we long to share our own spiritual gifts with those around us, and that we long to serve and be driven by the Lord. And as John Wesley says, that we do all the good we can do all, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And I always like to add to the end of that, with the reminder of the one who has sent you. And I want you to think about that, that, that this week. What drives your faith? Are you centering yourself on God? Or are you centering yourself on something that is not of God? Amen. Amen.